I have no idea what sort of turnout we would have. I don't know if you're here because you're eager to serve or because you want a guaranteed spot mass. <laughs> I'm going to assume that you're eager to serve, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, but it is great to see all of you here. It's, it's actually very encouraging to me um, because when we opened uh, back up for masses, first outside in our cars, and then once we opened up in here, um, a lot of our Eucharistic ministers weren't necessarily comfortable with coming back and distributing communion. And so we didn't really have a huge pool to, to draw from. Um, but uh, we do have four masses, and we've got um, six, now seven, and I'll explain that, uh, Eucharistic ministers assigned to each mass. Um, and slowly, more and more people are coming back. We're going to try and find ways to get more people we meet in here. We're going to have an overflow area that I'm going to talk about during our presentation tonight. Um, but possibly at some point we might go back to adding another Mass. I have no problem with celebrating another Mass. But each Mass takes 20 volunteers to make it happen. And so we needed to, uh, we're starting with the Eucharistic ministry, we're trying to build up that army so that we have more people to pull from. Then we'll also need to, then we'll need to build up the army of uh, ushers and lectors, maybe not so much. But uh, anyway, so I'm very excited that you're here, glad that you are ready to serve, and um, I look forward to serving with you. Um, before we start, why don't we begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, uh, we are grateful for the gift of the Eucharist, in which you give us your Son's body and blood, soul and divinity. You don't give us a symbol, but you give us Him. And so we ask you to help deepen our faith and understanding in that, but also to deepen our desire for it, and uh, a sense of service within our hearts to help others to encounter your Son in the Eucharist. Send your Spirit down upon our conversation this evening so that we can all learn a little bit more about the beauty of communion, but also how to uh, safely and properly and reverently distribute communion to our brothers and sisters. Uh, give us all wisdom and understanding tonight. And uh, we ask you to listen to our mother's prayers as we ask for them. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, to, to begin with, just want to introduce two people, just in case you don't know that. Three people, actually. This is Dean Tom. Um, and uh, behind the camera here is Sarah Kendrick, who is in our office and does a ton, especially now with the reopening. She's taken on a ton of responsibilities to help make that rock happen, so I'm very grateful to her hard work. And in the back, uh, Monica Greer, who is in charge of our Eucharistic ministry. She took that over six months ago, eight months ago, something like that, from, uh, from Ron Cody. And so, we're very uh, grateful for all of them and all that they do here. Uh, how many people here have been already trained as Eucharistic ministers and have come back and started serving? Okay. How many have been trained but haven't felt comfortable yet coming back and are trying to ease their way back in? Okay. And then how many have not been trained before? Great. So we've got a good mix of people. Um, thank you to all of you, but especially to those of you who want to be trained and uh, help us out. I think that's great. And for those of you who are want to come back but haven't yet, hopefully tonight will give you a little bit more comfort level with what we're doing here, trying to keep each other safe as we distribute communion. Um, but before we get into how we're distributing communion, I think we have to step back and... Um, remind ourselves what we receive in the Eucharist. Uh, who was able to, uh, I didn't hear his, his homily, but who heard Father Justin's homily at, on Corpus Christi? I remember. Okay. Uh, what about my homily on Corpus Christi? Okay, so a handful of you 
well. For some of you, this will be a bit of a repeat, but um, here's the gist of what I said. There are, uh, there's a recent study that said that of Catholics, only 30% believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. 30%. That's a really small number. And a good portion of those who don't believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist also think that the church teaches that he's not present, or that it's only a symbol. Friends, the church has never taught that. Now, do we speak of it as a symbol? Perhaps, at times, yes. But is it just a symbol? No. Is the crucifix a symbol of Jesus on the cross? Yes. Is that Jesus on the cross? No. Is um, the altar a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice? Yes. Is the altar Jesus? No. But does the hopes become the body of Jesus Christ? Yes. Does the chalice of wine become the blood of Jesus Christ? Yes. And we, have a church have, we as a church have always taught that. We've always believed that. It's, it's never changed. Now, some of us may have been catechized poorly by people who were well-meaning, maybe didn't know better, or maybe by some people who were like, I don't believe this, so I can't teach this to other people. But that doesn't change the truth of what we have in the universe. That it is indeed Jesus' body and blood, soul and divinity. If we believe that, that is a game changer, friends. It's a game changer from saying, okay, this is just communion, which is uh, an opportunity for me to kind of participate in the goodness of God and, you know, as, as a, a, a show that I am commun in communion with everybody else. <coughs> Certainly, those two things happen in communion. But if it's just that, let's stay home and watch on our TVs, right? But if it is really what the church has always said that it is, that is a game changer. Because we are really receiving our God into our bodies and souls. Which is pretty awesome. And like I said, the church has always taught that. Why? Why does the church teach that? Why, does the church do, why doesn't the church just teach that it's simple? Because you go to a lot of uh, Protestant churches and that's what they're going to teach. So, so why don't we teach that? Well, because that's not the way that Jesus presented it to us. In the Last Supper narratives, Jesus says, This is my body. This is my blood. He doesn't say this is a symbol. This is like my body. When you receive this, you, you'll think of me. No. This is my body. This is my blood. Okay, so is that enough? It should be, but there's, there's more. Especially when you look at the sixth chapter of John, where Jesus talks about the bread of life and being the bread of life that has come down to nourish humanity. But at some point, his language changes. And he starts to talk about something even deeper. He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, we want life in us. So what do we have to do, Jesus? Oh, we have to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. If, that's the, if it was the first time you heard that, you'd be like, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you're cool, but I gotta go. And that's what the Jews did. They're like, wait a second, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus doesn't say, you're not understanding. I mean, I'm going to give you something, and you're going to be able to think that it's me. It's going to be like a symbol of me, right? No, Jesus doubles down and uses language that talks about like animalistic chewing and gnawing on food. And he says again, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. 
He does not mince words. And when he's being misunderstood, he doesn't say, oh, look, look, or when he's being understood, they're, they're uh, shocked. He doesn't say they're misunderstanding. He says, no, this is what I really mean. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And that, uh, that Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, and we're giving thanks because God is good enough to us to actually give him his very self to us in the Eucharist. That Eucharist was uh, celebrated from the beginning. When's the first post-resurrection Eucharist? Post-resurrection Mass, when was the first one? The road to Emmaus, right? And what do they do when Jesus says the blessing and breaks the bread? They recognize him in what? The person sitting there? No, in the breaking of the bread. And they're so excited they run back and they tell them, yes, right? That was the first post-resurrection mass. And if you want to get me going, I love that story and I can talk about it for now. But that is yet another example of how the Eucharist communion is not meant to be just a symbol, but it's actually Jesus, because Jesus disappears at that point, because he doesn't have to be present, because he is present in the bread that was just broken, right? Make sense? Okay. So why am I putting so much emphasis in it? Why am I driving this home so heavily? Because I, I want our Eucharistic ministers to be believers. I think it's beautiful if you have a heart and you're like, how can I serve my brothers and sisters? I think that's amazing. But the truth is, there are a lot of different ways you can serve in the church. But if we're going to serve, literally, Jesus to other people, I want us to believe that. To believe that it's not just a symbol, but it's actually His body and blood. Because again, it's a game changer. Not just for our understanding what's happening for us, but also in the way that we do it. In the way that we talk about it. So, sometimes I'll say I'm maybe disappointed when I hear someone say, uh, well, I'll take the wine and you can take the bread. You know, I can distribute it in communion. Now, yes, does it look and taste and feel and smell like wine? Yes, all of its accidents are wine. But it's the blood of Christ. So let's refer to it that way. And does it look and smell and taste like bread? Yeah, its accidents are still bread. But the substance, what it really is, is Jesus' body. I want our Eucharistic ministers to believe that. No. Are we going to understand it? No. On this side of heaven, no. Which is fine. I want to ask you to understand it, because I don't. No one in this room does. But, are you willing to push past the, the lack of understanding and say, Jesus tells me this is the Eucharist, so I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to treat it that way reverence and respect and honor. And I'm going to see it as an honor to have him in my hands and to place him in someone else's hands. Or to, to have him in a chalice in my hands that someone else can receive. So that's why I'm kind of driving that home here at the beginning because I think it's very important. And if, if you don't believe and you don't want to believe, too much, no judgment here, but you may want to reconsider whether or not this is how you can serve in the church. I, I hope that doesn't sound harsh. I'm just, just being honest, okay? But if you do want to fight through that lack of understanding, which we all have to, and say, I still believe that Jesus meant what he said, and that he's given us an amazing gift in the Eucharist, then let's do this, right? Okay? Now, I, in the past, I've, I've given sort of a history of the distribution of communion. 
I didn't have time to find my notes. So I'm just going to lay out really quickly. Right at the beginning of the church, and we can read this from St. Justin Martyr. If you haven't read his description of Mass in about 125 AD, something like that, you need, you need to read it. Because it's like exactly the same thing of what we do now, except that the sign piece is in a different spot. But he talks about how the deacons, after everybody has received, would take the Eucharist to those that couldn't come. So from the beginning, there was this sense of needing people to be able to go out and take Jesus to, to others. Um, with time, the, the Mass kind of develops more in its in its details and uh, its structure becomes more refined. And like anything that we think is important, the church kind of puts a fence around it. When I talk to couples who are getting prepared for marriage, I'm like, the uh, sexual union in the church thinks it's an amazing thing. That's why she puts a fence around it and says it belongs in marriage only. Same thing with the Eucharist. We think it's so important, and so the church kind of puts a fence around it to protect it and to make sure that it was being reverenced and not desecrated or, or um, unappreciated or whatever. And so for the most part, it was priests and deacons who would distribute communion. And people would receive, in the early church, they received in both species, meaning the the body and the blood. But then you get the plagues of the Middle Ages, and people start to say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be drinking from the same chalice. And so it was determined that it was best to just receive the host, which is what we do now, right? I mean, we've always done, well, for a long time, we've suspended the reception of the cup from Advent through Holy Thursday. And this year we just extended it because of the, the pandemic. But people, when they started to receive the host, they said, okay, but am I not fully receiving Jesus? And the theologians have explained, no, Jesus is completely present, body and soul, uh, body and blood, soul and divinity, in the host and in the child. So either way, you are receiving Jesus completely. Now with time, they were able to distribute both species again. But it wasn't until really the last 50, 60 years where the idea of distribu distribution by extraordinary ministers came about. So an ordinary minister of the, of the communion would be a priest and your deacon or a, uh, or a person who is a instituted acolyte, an instituted servant, which is one of the steps along the process for a seminary. Um, so, but an extraordinary uh, Eucharistic minister would be someone who uh, is a lay person, but has been trained to be a Eucharistic minister, and in some way has been commissioned to do so. Been given uh, permission and sort of the, the mission of, by, by a pastor, a priest, to go and to distribute communion. So, for 50 or 50 years, people have, have done that, both in Mass and to those who can't come to Mass. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're trying to train you, and for those of you who want to, I'll say a blessing over you at the end. It's a way of kind of commissioning you to be Eucharistic ministers. Okay. So, with that, I can try to hit everything that I was going to do. I think I have. Um, at this point, now we want to talk about uh, distribution of communion here at St. Joseph. So, uh, Deacon, if you would help to distribute these for us. These are instructions that I finalized today that you will be able to go home and, and look back through. But we're going to walk through those um, this evening. And I have some, as, as we showed in our... I can't lift my finger. Uh, raising our hands earlier. 
Some of us have been in Christian ministry before, so we're used to a slightly different process. So the reason we invited you to come tonight is because we want you to um, be comfortable with the new process. And obviously the reason we have a new process is because of COVID and uh, wanting to keep our communicants and our university ministers safe. A couple of things to... Um,
And between each mass, based on how people signed up, I go around and adjust all of that because we're trying to maximize how many people we can get into the church. So again, people sit behind a piece of tape, they're an individual, or if they're a couple, they sit behind two orange signs in between the arrows. If they have three or more in their party, they sit behind blue signs in between the arrows. I emphasize that as often as I can because for some reason it's still hard for people to understand that. So the more people I can get on board with understanding, the closer we're going to get to full understanding of the seating situation. Okay. Before Mass, uh, we're going to send you a schedule. And on the schedule, your name is going to be, if you're, if you're scheduled to uh, distribute communion here in the church, your name is going to be highlighted in a color on the schedule, okay? And then there's going to be a, uh, a map, a plan of the church that has your, schedule, your color on it. So if, um, uh, Sarah, if you want to explain that really quickly, um, okay. I think you explained it pretty well. So I grabbed the map and the schedule that we've already posted. So everything's color coordinated by where you're going to be located. So it's really important to know your color. And along with the schedule, we are also sending out the map um, where you're supposed to go and distribute communion to the folks that are sitting in that area. Um, so these both get emailed out to you. Um, and they're also posted in both sacristies. So if that morning you just want a quick refresh on where you're going, this is what they look like. Yeah. So we'll explain why that matters in just a second. But the point of me talking about it now is make sure you check that before you come to Mass. Because um, if, if all people, all the, the EMs know where they're distributing, it goes a lot smoother. Okay. And if you have any questions, Feel free to come ask the, the priest or the deacon. Um, there are two possible assignments. Starting this weekend, to get people out of their hot cars, we're actually going to have overflow seating in the cafeteria of the church. There's a screen there so we can drop and we can show the live stream. Um, the cafeteria of the school. Sorry, cafeteria of the school, the new school. Thank you. Um, so there are uh, a screen there, you can watch the live stream, and then they will receive communion up there. We have one deacon, priest, or Jared Ryan Moss that is assigned to every Mass, but we're thinking that we're probably going to need another person. So starting next weekend, we're going to assign one person to be up there. So there are instructions on here for that person. So the first thing that you want to do before you get here is to make sure you know which area you are assigned to. If you're assigned up there, then you'll go up there to the new school. If you're assigned here, then you are going to make sure that you know what part of the church you are distributing the communion to. Okay, so if you are assigned to the church, you'll come with your spouse, family, by yourself, whatever. You'll check in. The ushers will seat you. And then um, I just went over where, what the seating um, entails and if you have questions. During the Our Father, those who are going to be dis uh, distributing communion will get up and they will go behind the altar. And if you want to look afterwards, you can. But there are, there are three sacristies behind the altar. The one on this side is the priest sacristy, so that's where the priest and the deacon get ready. The one on this side is the server sacristy, where the servers get ready and where the ushers or the uh, EMs used to put on their hats. And then if you went to the right when you went through that opening, there's actually a work sacristy over there. So there are four um, sinks back there. So you just kind of spread yourself out, you go and you wash your hands well with soap and water. Then, yes, Jared. Just to be sure, I don't know the answer to this question, but anybody who decided to be in the cafeteria, maybe they can stay there the whole time and have a whole night because they're the protected by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will go up there and stay up there. Yep. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so during the Lamb of God, the Christian ministers are going to come out. They're not going to go up at any point. Well, they're going to come out. Okay, and they're going to stay down on this lower level. 
And if you were, it, hopefully you remember which section you're going to distribute to, and that will be the section that you'll stand in front of. Okay, so if this is my section, this is where I'm going to stand. Because it helps to spread us out, and it makes it quicker for you to then begin to start distributing community. Okay? So there are six different areas. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you'll stand in front of your area. Okay? Then, after the priest receives communion and the deacon receives communion, then one of them is going to come down, starting over here, and will distribute communion to you. You will have your mask on, you'll say amen, take the mask off, put your hands out, receive communion, put the mask back on. Then, the server or the lector is going to come behind them and put sanitizer on your hands. So even though, yes, you, you just wash your hands, you put your hand by your face, and so we're just going to purify by sanitizing again, okay? And then, after you've had your hand sanitized, they're also going to give you a Clorox, Clorox wipe, okay? So they'll just have one of those Clorox tubes, and you pull one off the top. And have that in, in one of your hands. Then someone will come and give you your Saborium, okay? My suggestion is you take the Clorox wipe and put it in the same hand as the Sibori. And you'll find out why in just a second, okay? So once you receive your Sibori and your wipe, your hands are sanitized, you receive communion yourself, you've got your mask on, you turn around and you start distributing, okay? So I'm going to uh, put my mask on here because I'm going to walk through the church a little bit, but um, everybody has been seated at the edge of a section. So if you look at your where you're seated, seated, seated right now, you're either at the end of a pew, you're at the front of a section, or you're at the back of a section. The reason for that is when we distribute communion, we don't have to go into the pew. We can just make our way around the section and people will be available. If they're in the front, we distribute it to them. If they're on the edge of the pew, we distribute it to them. If they're in the back row, they turn around, we distribute it through the back row. And then the people who are seated in those seats, you just you can distribute to them. They stand up They do stand yeah. Everybody stands, and then they sit after they receive. So that helps you to know who still needs to receive in case you get a little confused. That everybody's going to stand and then be seated after they receive communion. Okay? So I'm just going to walk through real quick so that you can see how that works. Uh, yeah? What about family members? Okay. So families, I either seat them in the front of a section or in the back of a section. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just watch me here. <laughs> so this is my section. I'm going to come through and distribute. And the people in the back will turn around. That's why they sit behind the signs. Okay? They receive communion back here. <coughs> then people are on the edge of these pews. I'm going to distribute to them as I go. We'll hit that one there. And then I come around here and hit this side here. Okay? If this was my section, that's all you got to do. Just walk around your section and hit the people that are on the edges of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, good question. So, when you look at the map, sometimes the map has uh, your color on both sides of the aisle, and so that means that you're going to hit both sides of that aisle. Yeah, so you, you will have to reach a little bit to get to the second person if there's a couple. They won't step out into the aisle. You'll just reach in a little bit to, to distribute to them. Good question. In, in the prior room? Okay. So there's a seventh person who is either a deacon or a priest who is in charge of distributing for those who want to receive on the tongue. So, so none of you will need to distribute communion to anybody who receives on the tongue, okay? We instruct them to go back to the narthex. 
the person who's in charge of that is supposed to be specifically for them, only distributing to those who are receiving on the tongue, because between each person, they have to sanitize their hands. So it's a longer process. But to uh, make it work, we just had them stop at the, at the cry room first, hit everybody there, and then go to the back and distribute to those people. Okay? Okay. Are we walking through pews? Are we walking through the pews? Oh yeah, so the, 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 the reason we're seated the way they are is that there, we, there shouldn't really be a need for you to walk through the pews. We're trying to minimize you tripping with the Eucharist or whatever, so we're, making, we're trying to make it as easy and simplest for you, in, in theory. I know it might seem a little complicated, but you don't have to walk through the pews at all. Because again, the people in the back, they should be turning around for you. And if they don't, just gently remind them to do that, okay? Um, they, they'll get used to it eventually. Because some of our EMs have not known, and maybe have gone kind of through the pew in front of them. But we're, we're going to train them to just be able to turn around and receive behind them, okay? Okay. When you are, uh, they're going to receive the way that you did. With their mask on, they're going to say amen. Then they'll take the mask off, put their hands out, and receive, consume, put the mask back on. Now, earlier this week, I allowed people in, actually I guess today was the first day, in mass to, when they're in their spot, they can take their mask off. And I'll probably do that for masses this weekend too. If I'm assured that everybody is seated where they're supposed to, then I know that they are all safely distanced from each other. Um, but they are instructed to put it back on when they stand up for communion. So they should have it on when you present Jesus to them. A good way to kind of remind them of that is instead of holding the host out like they're going to receive it right away, keep the chaplain, keep the ciborium close to you and go to the body of Christ. And then they should remember, oh, yeah, yeah, I have my mask on, I've got my mask on, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to remove it, and then I'll put my hands out and receive it. Now, we're going to come across people who are going to forget or don't want to do it, whatever. We would like them to follow the system. But you holding Jesus in your hand is not the time to be instructing them or upgrading them about how they receive communion. So at that time, just, uh, you know, distribute how they are. But uh, the, the one exception I would make to that is if someone says they want to receive on the tongue, you just hold the Eucharist and go, please go back to the narthex and receive back there. They should know that. We make that announcement. I haven't come across anybody that hasn't done that. But, um, but otherwise, it's not really the time to go, no, you gotta put your mask on before I give you Jesus. Jesus is just gonna frazzle that. So, amen, then take it off, then receive it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that you don't have to use one hand and you got Jesus in the other hand. Now, a lot of people end up putting their hands out before they take their mask off, so be it. Um, but my concern, the reason why we're doing that is because I don't want them breathing in your direction. So that's why they have the mask on to say amen. But uh, how so far, maybe like maybe more than two people on one side of the pew, right? They would be either at the back pew or the front pew. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you won't have to reach in across two people to give communion. So it doesn't like me, but if someone who is um, physically handicapped and has a hard time making their way to the perfect one sit on their tongue, yeah, what I would, my suggestion would be, that's a great question, my suggestion would be, when you're finished distributing, instead of coming up to the altar right away, go and find the priest to remind them, and lead them even to that person. Yeah, that hasn't happened, but that's a great question, that's probably one. Um, okay, once you have finished your session, um, if you, if you want to help another section, you can, um, but sometimes it's just cleaner to let, let the other Eucharistic minister do their section um, so that they don't get kind of confused and some people are standing up and they're not in the order that they were going to go. But you, you can help them if you want. But once you're finished, you're going to come up here to the altar and you're going to take your ciborium and 
place it on the altar. One thing I forgot before we get to this point. Why do you have a Clorox wipe? So there are going to be times where you, when you distribute communion, their hands should be out like this. You're going to take the host and come from on top. You're not going to drop it. You're going to take it, and once it touches their hand, then you just let go, and it'll lay down. Okay? So there shouldn't need to be any... I mean, in the past, we might do this, and there'd be a lot of touching. You can just come from the top. Don't, don't drop it. But just come from the top and, and sort of lay it in there. Lay Jesus in there. Um, if, though, there is a contact, it probably means nothing. But that's why you've got that Clorox water. Okay, so you're going to, once you contact it, instead of going, hey, I need a sanitizer, you just wipe your hand on it. Okay? So you're going to keep it in the hand that's holding the, the ciborium, and then the hand that's distributing would be the one that would just kind of wipe on there. Okay. At the end, when you come up, you're going to put your chap, your ciborium here, and there should be a basket on the altar. If it's not on the altar, it'll be on the greetings table or maybe over there. There should be a basket out here. You put your Clorox wipe in there because it is possible that a little piece of Jesus might be on that wipe. And so we want to make sure that we're not throwing that away. Okay? So after Mass, we take that uh, basket, we, we collect it in the back, and then sometime after the weekend, we take all of those and we burn them. Okay? So that's one way of uh, properly disposing of something that's in us. Okay. Low blue. Low blue. Okay. Um, those who need a low blue host will be instructed that they will receive uh, their host after uh, others have received. So if they want a low blue host, they'll tell you, you just keep going and they're going to keep standing. And then the head Eucharistic minister will have the low blue host. And we'll go around and hit those folks that um, still need it. So it's one extra little step, but I haven't really figured out a, a better system for that. So um, that's how the low blue host will be distributed. It's just one person bringing those hosts to the people where they are. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. When you bring your host up, your ciborium with uh, Jesus up, if you're the only one up here, please stay. So that we kind of keep watch with Christ, okay? And then, but if someone else is already up here, you just put your ciborium down, put your wipe into the basket, and then go back to your seat. If you're the first person up here, you wait until maybe the priest is up there, and then you can feel free to priest or deacon, you can feel free to go back to your uh, pew. Okay. The ciboria, so that's multiple ciboria on the ciboria, uh, are purified and washed by the head EM or the deacon or the priest at the mass. So you don't need to go back. There's, after, basically after you've washed your hands, there's no need for you to go back to any of the sacristies. You, you're, you're finished with anything that would need to happen back there for you, unless you're a head of him. Okay? So any questions on how we distribute communion here in the church? Would you please clarify how the name of the drop on the host? Okay. If a host is dropped on the floor, one hope is that the, the person would feel comfortable enough that they would see that host. But if they don't, then you're going to take it and put it into um, the other hands that's not distributing. You, you can consume it right there if you're, if you're bold enough. That's fine. Or you can put it into the hand that's holding the support. Then at the end, uh, when you come up, you can either tell the priest, hey, this one dropped on the floor, um, or the deacon. Uh, that's probably your best bet to do that. Um, but what he may do, he may just go ahead and consume it, or 
Uh, sometimes we put it in the ablution bowl, which is this glass bowl up here. Next to the tabernacle. This is where you, uh, people would dip their fingers. There's a little cloth there to, to get any particles off of your fingers. That gets uh, poured into what's called a sacrarium, which is a uh, sink that goes straight into the ground. Then you go into the sewer system. Sometimes we'll put hosts in there and let them kind of dissolve there and then pour them into that sacrarium if we don't feel comfortable consuming them. But those are kind of your three options. See if they're willing to take it. If not, you can take it, or you can put it in your hands and then inform the priest or the deacon uh, when they come back to the altar. So, yeah. Sure. Yes, um, if we are uh, going to try to kind of get our hands around that a little bit, just making sure that people who are taking a picks with hosts um, have been trained on how to do that, so we're kind of slowly going to go through that process. But since so many people are used to it already, I'm not going to deny that to someone. So if they do have a, a PIX because they're taking it to a loved one, um, you can put the host in there. It would be helpful to me because I don't know all those people. So if you happen to recognize who that person is, feel free to reach out and let us know because we're trying to put together a list so that we can kind of reach out to those folks and make sure that they're trained so that um, yeah, everything's just above board there. Okay, other questions about what we do in here, and then we'll quickly go through the school, and then you can be free to go. It's okay. Uh, so, uh, before, you, uh, before you receive the post, support, or anything like that, why not you sit and type your hands before you go, like, before you go up or anything like that, and, uh, like, as you're distributing, Hands are already sanitized. You put the hose down, um, somebody can lay there, and then you just like you wipe it off with the Clorox bleach or something. Okay. So the, the, you, you're first going to wash your hands, and then after you receive communion yourself, you're going to have your hands sanitized, and then you'll have a Clorox wipe with you when you're going around to distribute. You only need to use the Clorox wipe if you've touched somebody else's hand. You do not need to use it in between each time. It's only so in case you have accidental contact with somebody else's hand. Um, okay. Yeah. But that does help to clarify. Yeah, each time you don't have to do just when you have contact. Uh, I, I've experienced where the hand gets sticky and wet from the Clorox wipe, and it takes a while to it's not sinking on the host. Do you have a suggestion for that? Just wait a little bit to dry? Yeah, and you, you'll just have to kind of keep keep going until they dry off. Keep rubbing them together until they. Yeah, it is kind of an annoying side effect of that, yeah. Uh, so we're in that meeting, we're going to leave them on the altar, and then they're going to put them on a tree, on a tree table, and then the head minister will take them back to that. But we're not going to take them back to that. Right, you will not take the Saborium back to the, the um, sacristies. Right, that was that was not the not the intended protocol. Yeah. No, you, you once you said um, you don't go back to the sacristies, no, you're done with the sacristies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, head ministers uh, will slowly be trained to set up. After you can, uh, complete your, your round <laughs> and you're putting your child up back up on the altar, then should you wipe your hands before you put your uh, uh, Clorox wipe? Like, that's, that, that, uh, that's one possibility is you, you can you do can that because you know that it's going to be taken care of. Well, you, you also 
cattle to host too. Um, so if you've got something on your hand from the, you know, from the host. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I want to want to get you, respect your time and get you out of here. So let's look at overflow seating real quick. So this weekend is going to be our first run at this. So we'll see. I, I, I want to give people an option if they didn't get a chance to sign up and they also don't want to sit in their car on a hot morning. So we're going to open up the school, the new school, up the hill um, in the morning uh, before masses, about 15 minutes before mass. We'll open it and there, if you haven't been to the school before, there's a, a gathering area, an entry area in the middle and there are glass doors on either side of that. We're going to have two people at each mass out there, so we're going to open up one door on either side of that um, entryway so that people, if they want to, they can park in the, in the east lot here. Yes, the east lot, go up the stairs and go in through that door. Or they can park in the parking lot by the early education center and come in through the west doors. There will be two people. If you're assigned up there, you're going to be one of them. And the other one's going to be either Jared or a priest or a deacon. And they're going to know the routine so they can kind of walk you through anything if you don't quite understand something here, okay? But your, your job is actually twofold up there. You're going to be ushering people to their seats, and then you're going to be distributing community. Um, so you, people will come to the door. We have uh, seats up there for, for couples and for groups. And so if it's a single person or a couple, you sit them in a couple section. If they're a group, you put them in the group. And, and if there are more than four people, you might have to move a chair from another section over there. But they're all spaced out so that everybody is uh, socially spaced, socially distanced. Huh? They're all chairs, yeah. Um, once people, once it's full, then if anybody else comes to the door, you say, sorry, we're full, but you can be in your car and you can listen on 102.7 or you can watch the live stream. The radios are going to work best the closer the people are to the church, so you may want to just let them know that if you think that they're going to be listening on the radio. Or if they say, what's the, what's the number? 1027, you may want to move your car closer to the church because the, the, the transmitter is here in the sacristy. Okay? Um, then once Mass starts, you can be inside with, uh, with your family if you can come with them. And the Mass will be on, on the live stream, on screen. And uh, at the Our Father, like we do here, go to wash our hands. You'll go to the, um, the bathrooms and the, the, uh, the priest or the deacon can show you where that is if you, if you don't know where they are there. But then the priest or the deacon or Jerry, there's actually a chapel up there. They're going to go and get the two saboria, bring them down, okay? And they'll give you, uh, at communion time, they'll give you communion like we would here. You've got your mask on, you say amen, you take it off, you receive, then you purify your hands afterward. Um, and then they'll give you one of the saboria. And then the two of you are just going to make your way around the uh, cafeteria, and people are going to stay where they are, just like they are here. And you're going to distribute communion to all of them. Here's the difference. At the end, instead of taking your subordinate somewhere, you're just going to stand with that priest or deacon and wait for the end of Mass. And then, you're going to, uh, there will be some people who will stay in their car, and they will be instructed at the end of Mass, at the final blessing, to drive through the overhang entrance to the school. You and the priest or deacon or Jared are just going to stand on either side of those cars and distribute communion. If they need a low food host, the priest or deacon or Jared will take care of that. If they want to receive on the tongue, there will be instructions for them to, to kind of park for a little while and come at the end, and the priest or deacon or Jared will take care of that. So you're basically just out there helping to distribute communion in the normal way or in, on the hands. Um, and, uh, and then once you're finished, you can ask the priest or deacon or Jared if they want help. If they don't, you just give them a saborium and, and you're done. Um, how
how people will get out when those cars are coming through, I haven't completely figured that piece out yet, but um, let, let the priest or the deacon or Jared kind of worry about that. You're just there to help see people when they come in, to distribute communion during communion time to those inside, and then to distribute communion to those driving through at the end of Mass. Make sense? Okay, so it'll be clear when you're scheduled whether or not you're scheduled to be here or up there. And if you're up there, there's, there's really no reason for you to come down here if you're not going to stay here. So you'll just experience Mass, pray Mass up there. No, that's going to be first come, first seat. Mm -hmm. So that's for people who forget to sign up or didn't sign up in time, gives them kind of a second option of how they can go to Mass. Thank you, yeah, great question. So we are instructing people to get out of their cars. Receive with their, or say amen with their mask on, take the mask off, receive, put it back on, get back in the car and drive off. Um, when we didn't have the overflow seating, some of the masks, we had a lot of cars up there, and so we were starting to like give to two or three cars at a time, and then let them pull through, and then hit another two or three cars and let them pull through. But they're being instructed to get out. Now, if you have someone who it's really hard for them to move, you can distribute to them through the window, but ideally, everybody will be getting out. That's what we've been instructed to do. Your family will go with you too. I mean, you could, Sarah. She's um, asking if they, the family comes with them. I would have them just be at the cafeteria with them, right? Yeah, so on the schedule, you'll know if you're in the cafeteria. Um, so we won't assign you seating here, but since you'll have to be there early, your family will have seating up at the cafeteria, just so you guys are all together. Yeah, it simplifies things if you're all together. Um, what's the protocol for people who are receiving request for blessing? Okay, if, if someone comes up, or not comes up, if they in their spot, they want a blessing, uh, and they cross their arms, you can say to them, uh, may Jesus be in your heart, okay? A priest or a deacon will, uh, may actually bless them. I usually bless them, but technically lay people should not be giving liturgical blessings, and so to say, may Jesus be in your heart would be uh, a way to respond to them. So all these years I've been saying God bless you, <laughs> uh, I think you're not alone. You're not alone. I think there's some confusion on that, but that's probably the, most, the, the best way to do it is to not give some sort of blessing. It wasn't really an official blessing. You know. No. But you don't want them walking away thinking they've officially been blessed, I guess. Gotcha. Okay, if you're assigned up there or here, I would say about 15 minutes before Mass would be good. So that you have, just in case you have last minute questions, or there's some sort of change that has to happen, like, I don't know what that would be, but um, it'd be good just to be here, settled in about 15 minutes beforehand. Do we check in when we come in? The, our two entrances are this west door and the narthex door, and there will be greeters there who will have a list they're going to ask you what your name is, and then your name's going to have the number of people in your party next to it. And so then the usher knows what type of chair, what type of seating to take you to. But yes, you will get checked in, and an usher will seat you. But you don't have to check in as a Eucharistic minister. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, oh, sorry, that doesn't matter. Okay. No, you, you'll know, and that's, that's good. Do we have to sit in this, in the area where we're distributing? You do not need to sit where you're distributing. Just remember where you're distributing, and that's good enough. That is blessing. When someone goes and comes down, who can bless them? Well, technically, a priest or a deacon are the only ones who can bless them. So you're not going to bless them, you're going to say, you know, have, have Jesus in your heart. So all these years I've sent people down, a 
Okay. I mean, people, we would still, I would still encourage people to come forward, even if I know they're going to go to a lay person. But I, I would encourage the lay person not to give them a blessing, but instead to say that to them. If, if for some reason you don't have the six Eucharistic ministry, should if someone gives the Eucharistic ministry and they see that, should they be fired from up to that particular position? Uh, that's a great, great question. I would say, yeah, if you only see, um, well, it's tricky because sometimes you might have the deacon and the priest at the altar, and they can both, dis uh, Monsignor will not be distributed, but Father Justin and his replacement, Father Joel, Deacon Tom, Deacon Mark, myself, uh, if, if Deacon, the other Deacon Tom helps at a Mass, we all can distribute, and so we will. So when you're doing the count, Make sure you're including the, the, the clerics that could, that could um, So if you see Father Scott and Deacon Tom or Deacon Mark. You only need four. Right. Because so. Deacon Tom will distribute out here like anybody else, and Father Scott will go back to the back. I, I would try to tell them as they go back because you have to wash your hands if you're going to you know, come True. out. And that's hands. another thing. When we do schedule you, Make sure you. Yeah, you if come. you're scheduled, please come. Uh, that just makes it easiest for us. Because it, it might be hard for the. The, the head EM should kind of maybe look around and make sure that all of them are here. But since we've got new people and everything, they're not going to necessarily know who you are. So please just make sure that you come. Or if you can't come, that you find a replacement or you let Monica or Sarah know so that they can help you find a replacement. Okay. Great questions. Thank you. Anything else? So go straight to that person's house. Don't go to Pega's and have breakfast, and then go shopping, and then go over there, okay? If you make that commitment, it's kind of a commitment to go right after Mass to distribute communion to them, just out of reverence for the meetings. Um, but if, if you don't have a booklet with you, my suggestion on how you can do that is to, um, to just start in prayer, you know, sign the cross, have them call to mind their sins, and although you're not going to be able to forgive them like a priest would, at least they're calling to mind their sins. If you want to read the readings with them, you can do that. That'd be great. Um, and then you're going to jump to the Our Father, and then you're going to hold up the host and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And then they, if they know the response, they'll respond. And then you give them communion. And then you can just pray with them a little bit afterwards. So you can do sort of a simplified uh, method like that if you don't have one of those books with you that you know might be a little more robust in its explanation of what to do. Does that help? That helps. She just expected tomorrow. Tomorrow, so you were hoping to do it tomorrow. You were hoping to do it tomorrow. Okay. Are you coming to one of the masses tomorrow? 
Okay, yeah, so you can, you can take others for that. Yeah. Okay. Sarah, did I miss anything? Take it down. Good. Okay. Thanks for paying attention, folks. It's a long time to listen to me. Uh, so let me give you a blessing and a commissioning here. So, Father, Son,